back to Heart to Heart with me, Shakti Sundari. I'm here at a beautiful retreat centre in Ubud Bali called The Ark, which is run by Anthony Avignano, together with his beautiful partner, Amy Rochelle. Amy is a detox naturopath, and Anthony Avignano is very well known for his alchemy of breath, breath work, and so much more. So really looking forward to speaking to them both. Welcome, Anthony, and welcome, Amy. Thank you. Let's take a breath. <sighs> More breath. Yeah. Thank you. It's just nice to connect with you. Mm. Yeah, because you are sitting in this space of love mm. and togetherness right now. I think I'd like to just kick off by kind of going into that. Of course, just last week you were celebrating your engagement yeah. in the yeah. most beautiful ceremony. Yeah, yeah, it was a bit unexpected. It was a little bit more of an elaborate Balinese ceremony than we had anticipated, and opening it up to all community was, was wow, it was amazing. Super powerful. Wow. We didn't know that the engagement in Bali is um, in some ways more significant, the ceremony, than mm -hmm. the wedding itself. So. Mm -hmm. didn't, didn't expect all the fruit and flowers and yeah all the all the love really yeah, all the welcoming it was really beautiful it was very touching yeah from all the community as well yeah. you know i said to anthony let's let's go through and we'll invite you know, specific people and he said no let's invite everybody <laughs> this is amazing well it was very evident from from witnessing that that you have created this amazing space of love and community mm. all around you here at the Ark and in Bali. Um, have you both ha had a sort of a relationship of living in Bali for some time, or how has mm. it come about that you chose to celebrate here in, in, in that way? Yeah, we've both lived, I've been here 12 years and Amy for about seven or eight, so mm -hmm. we have done a lot of work here, both mm. inside and um, making use of the wonderful support systems and the energy of the island and also um, develop their own practices here too. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of well-friended, we're surrounded by mm -hmm. uh, the community that we really always sought. Mm -hmm. And um, it seemed a shame to skip out without owning what we're doing amongst our community. That's why we wanted to do the yeah. ceremony. Yeah, we've. We've breathed with so many people here, or they've been to my retreats or to Anthony's work and you've taken programs with us or just in general, knowing a lot of people here, we really, it was really important to us to bring people together and to share in not just our love, but the love amongst us all. It was really exciting. It's funny because we talked about um, marriage and getting engaged and we've been also we have dear friends who are poly, polyamorist, and um, and so all of these issues arose after we became lovers, uh, after we joined in relationship. We'd known each other for four plus four or more years before that as friends, and then best friends, and then it transformed into becoming a couple. And um, I remember that. I remember one of the first things that happened after we kind of made the deal, you know, we kind of agreed that that's, yeah, okay, we're going to get engaged, was that our shadows came out. It was like almost immediate, like the week after the shadow came out to play, and it was okay. Now I'm understanding that this means holding that at the same time as being present and staying soft and unarmored. And so... It really moves, moves me even to think of the processes that we went through. And, and I, I remember people uh, asked me, are you excited? And I said, you know, I really don't want to be excited. I want to do the work. So it's a very natural progression. And, um, and I really feel like that's what it's been. It's been about learning to hold myself in my own sovereignty and, and to um, be available and... Uh, and vulnerable at the same time. And that's meant coming out to Amy, coming out to myself in many ways. Um, and then coming out to Amy and her being able to hold that and the same coming to me too. 
So when you say coming out, you mean sharing more of your vulnerability? Your shadow? Well, the shadow, of course, because that came out and sort of blurted out after that initial agreement that we made. I remember there was a couple of very challenging weeks. I can't remember why, but I, I remember them being like, whoa, gosh, you sure you want to do that? You know, it was, uh, it was, it was meant to be that, to, to make sure, you know, it was like, uh, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> and uh, when both of the shadows are out to play, of course, everything, it gets quite, te it can be tempestuous and, um, and escalate. But we were just, we just so much love. This woman has so much love. And whenever I'm difficult, I hear her say that um, I'm wondering if there might be a, a higher way we could communicate, a better way that we could communicate. And it always touches me so deeply that um, I know it's time to do my work. It's time to do more work. And um, I couldn't ask for a better mirror. So. It's a real relief to hear you say that because I can so relate from my own experience of being in sacred relationship that um, shadow shit has absolutely risen in quite a well, tempestuous, overwhelming, hmm. the most powerful experience I've ever had of my shadow and another's actually. Yeah. And, and yet there's a knowing underneath that of the love and the truth and the uh, divine purpose for, for, for this union. Yeah. And I think it's also really important for people to hear that because of course others see this love which mm. is beautiful mm. and so inspiring and real and true. Yeah. And it's important to know that there is a part of it which involves, you, you've mentioned work, and yeah. work on yourself. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. <laughs> I thought I'd done yeah. it all. Yeah. <laughs> There's still more. Yeah. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, I think that to be lighthearted as well, like, okay, if Anthony, the so called shadow, is, is present, then I don't need to take that about me. I don't need to take that as a reflection of myself per se and react back to that. I can, unless I'm triggered, I can. Mm. <laughs> hold that and love him anyway and give him a space and when it passes then we can talk about it you know or or i will take space or let's let's just let it breathe for a while and you know it's it's wonderful to be at this time of life where I like to think it's a little bit more of a mature relationship than what i've ever experienced in the past so that we have a little bit more autonomy and and an interdependent connection where you can be in whatever kind of mood you're in. That's all right. It doesn't mean I need to uh, play along or rescue or do anything for you. You just be where you are. And I'm just going to be where I am and all is well. It's okay. You know, or if I'm really acting out, hopefully he'll give me that space. Or sometimes he'll really sit me down and say, Amy, like this. And if Anthony gives me his wrath, which doesn't happen very often, I know I really need to listen. So I will surrender to what he has to say to me as well because I really, really trust him. And never before have I trusted a man mm -hmm. so much that I would actually listen to him and allow him to guide me. So, and, and I think that we both just really want to um, go beyond a lot of our past mistakes and not repeat the same things again. So let's do something a little bit different now. A lot different. Has there been um, any particular technique or practice that either of you has or you've shared together that you found helpful, really helpful, supportive when you get to those points where one of you's triggered or both of you's triggered? Breathe. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say? Breathe. 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 Breathing. Breathing. Mm. Yeah. We breathe. We have an agreement about ten breaths. If it gets really rough, that we take ten. Uh -huh. We look at each other. Um, it's incredible, isn't it? When you feel the adrenaline rising, it's so quick to leap into action, and, and it takes quite a bit to, or it seems impossible that it could ever subside. And um, we've had those moments, of course, mm. and. Um, I'm always amazed at 
um, actually how simple it is once it's, the adrenaline is deconstructed and it subsides. In retrospect, it always seems like, oh, God, that wasn't so difficult. After all, it seems so impossible. Um, but we've been blessed with um, uh, with some agreements that we've made together mm. that were actually not designed by us. Um, they mm. were designed by Gay and Katie Hendricks. Mm. Um, they're called the co-commitments, and there are actually nine of them. Mm. And um, mm. helps a lot. I remember one time we really got into trouble, and we were on the coast here, and we were just feeling there was just this. This wasn't space between us. This shape had become distance and for about three weeks yeah about three mm. weeks great just grew and grew and it was like whoa boy it's just very destabilizing mm. and um so we went for a walk and, and uh, i said to amy let's just remember the co-commitments and see if there's some kind of guidance in there and we remembered all but one and we kept walking and by this time we were working together trying to remember what it you know was it what was it like oh, gosh i'm really digging in there but i can't figure out what it is and then we i think i took out my phone and looked at them or something and it said it's the commitment to be close <laughs> and of course you know i was so touching that immediately as soon as i realized i was doing my part to not be close that i want to show up so um I'm very grateful to Gay and Katie Hendricks for their work. Yeah. I've studied their work and yeah. I just adore them both. Yeah, they're my heroes too, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's really great. Yeah. In the beginning of our relationship, yeah. Anthony said to me, very beginning, he said, would you be willing to do these co-commitments with me? Yeah. And when I read them, I, well, that's, that's my dream to be with a man that will bring something like this into our relationship. I said, yes, of course. So I think that has given us a guideline to follow these principles and to have something that helps keep us back on track if we get off. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Can you remember what they are actually? It's not a test, but just yeah. <laughs> it would be great. Pretty much, we can try, yeah, yeah. let's see. Commitment to do, to, your own, close. Yeah. to do your own work. To, to reach for your highest potential, to support your partner reaching for their highest potential. Commitment to... Microscopic truth. Yeah. Tell the microscopic truth. Yeah. To, to have, have fun. fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, to, to treat everything as if I'm 100% responsible for creating it. Yeah. To react as if it's my responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, to keep your agreements. Keep your agreements, yeah. And there's one there missing. See? It's probably the one that we, we need. We really to, need, yeah. We need to remember. And it always is that way. It's yeah. Whichever one we can't remember is yeah. usually the one that needs the attention. Yeah. So I guess I do have to ask, I have to ask about your individual work and then about what you are co-creating. So could we start a little bit, Anthony, I know you've been working in breath work for such a long time. Mm -hmm. You have this alchemy of breath. Can you tell us about your modality, the training, your techniques that you offer? Yeah, um, of course. It's my passion. It's easy to do that. Um, I found out about the breath. I mean, I must have breathed thousands of people by now, but I found out about the breath because I got really ill. And um, I was actually reduced to not being able to move for quite a while, for a month or more. And Can I ask when this was in your life? This was about six, seven years ago. And all I had left was the breath. That was all I could do, was to breathe um, and feel. And um, recently, I was in a writing group, and one of our one of our co-writers wrote a little short eight-word poem that really touched me and explained everything to me about my experience. He said the poem reads, "When I finally stopped squirming, God kissed my heart." And so I think for me that was a pivotal moment and I understood that what surrender was, really what it was. Because so many ways I tried to struggle to reach my guitar or to make a phone call or, but it was all too painful to move. And um, so that's when I really understood that breath had a huge impact on my life. 
Were even though for... Sorry, were you already teaching for a purpose? No, I wasn't. I'd studied it for many years in different forms. I'd studied it, but I never really understood that it was going to be my dharma to, mm. to teach it. Mm. And um, so I'd experimented with pranayama and holotropic breath work and um, um, different birthing systems for natural childbirth, Le Mans when I was 17, and then Le Boyer when I was 23, and and coached my partner to have the child all during the pregnancy. So I never really realized that I was so close to it. Uh, I studied Sufi breathing techniques, which were, I found really powerful and mm. maintained for many years. And so this suddenly kind of gave me the gift of understanding of where I wanted to go. And I met Christabel and she came into my writer's group and we did a breath work. And then so that's Christabel Zamor. Just going to mention her name. Christabel Zamor. And Christabel then introduced me to Dana and Ashana. Very quickly, a month later, I was with Dana and Ashana, who are staying here and starting a workshop here next yeah. week yeah. at the Ark. And um, I studied with them. And then I really started to get involved. And I did some transformational breath. And I studied with another fine man, Giten Tonkov, who is does trauma work and he's the best, I think, in the world. Um, and then after that I began to understand that this whole lifetime of experience of not just um, breath but also coaching and hypnotherapy and my inner journey was what seemed to be impactful for people. So I bring that to my breath teaching. and. So the breath is really the tool, but mm. the question is how can we use it in our everyday life? Mm. So these sessions can be quite fantastical and wonderful. Mm. Um, and then what do I do? And that's really where it gets fascinating to me is to work with people, uh, of course, to see someone's joy. The first time they've done breath work is just, just ecstatic to me. It feels like I'm giving away free chocolate to kids mm -hmm. or something, you know. It's just so wonderful. Um, and to see them journey with it and how they can actually employ it to, to really deepen their own journey um, so quickly is really the reward. That's the greatest reward. Curious just to know what happened then to, you said you were very unwell. Mm. You were practically unable to move. Mm. You had this kind of realisation then that all you could do was breathe, so suddenly this awareness of breath, of yeah. life, yeah. came to you. Yeah. And then what happened in terms of um, that awareness and your physical healing? Well, there was an angel that showed up. <laughs> <laughs> and Amy's an intuitive, and she said, you've got parasites, and there's one man that can help you. And I was pretty weak at that point. Um, it was the second illness, same illness, second time. And um, I managed to get to New York. I got a flight with a wheelchair and got to New York. So you were that ill that you... I couldn't much. really... Well, he almost oh, yeah. died. I, yeah, I was almost gone. Yeah, it was really yeah, bad. Was. Yeah. So there were two things. There was the wake-up call. I heard my brother outside the window talking to a friend of ours saying, I reckon he's got six or seven days left. And Were I you heard that. With something, like in no, the Western? They tried, and no. you know, I had 27 different doctors and I don't know how many little pricks in my All arm. All kinds of parasite testing. I mean, we took him to oh. so many different doctors yeah. across Europe. Wow. No, yeah. I couldn't. Nobody knew what it was. Yeah. Just this one doctor in New York knows what it is and can, and can diagnose it reliably. Well, as a, as a naturopath, though, I mean, it wasn't just intuition. I could see that he had the symptoms yeah. of, of parasites that uh, the type of testing that's available in modern day world doesn't really articulate what's there. It's not precise enough. And this one specialist in New York, Dr. Cahill, who's the chief advisor of medicine to the UN, he's a parasite specialist. And I knew that we had to get Anthony to him. And he saved Anthony's life, mm -hmm. really. Well, you both did. His, his story is something we're very passionate about for people understanding 
how the practices that we, that we teach can help them, but also to know that there is hope when nothing else works. It's just getting proper diagnosis a lot of the time. Mm. So before this moment, you were already doing, you were saying you were already doing some kind of coaching and an alternative Yeah, I had lifestyle. a lot of practices. I had, actually had one foot in each world. I was, in, I was involved in architecture in Italy and restoring old buildings. Uh -huh. um, and, uh, but, but always knew that I needed to go somewhere else and c kind of got scared off spirituality as a youngster uh, because of a cult experience and, um, and so was kind of like, no, I'm not going to touch that. I kind of blocked it for a while. I was a single parent and kind of focused on my work and my child raising and then mm. And then later, when he was 21, things began to shift, and I was able to move back towards spirit again. Mm. Yeah. And is that now uh, an important part of your work and your being, your spirituality? Every breath, every, in, every inhale, yeah. Mm. And um, love, just to uncover until we find the love. I remember people talking about my recovery. I had a lot of time to think about recovery and, I, and it occurred to me what a, what, a, what a terrible word it is. Why should we recover? Why can't we just stay uncovered? And have you ever noticed how when people get ill they get more real? You know, they get more genuine. And um, so that was my work, was to stay uncovered. Really. Mm. Yeah. yeah. You know, it seems like you were brought together divinely for this purpose. But before you met Anthony, what was your work? It's the same work I do now, mm -hmm. which is um, it's what I call holistic nutrition and detox. And train people to be teachers of this work, really. I don't really do so much of a nutritional or a fasting practice one-on-one -on -one with people. I train students to do that. Um, but fasting is my biggest passion in my work along with uh, emotional work. So we're working on deep emotional levels uh, with fasting, with breath work, um, teaching people how to make raw food mainly. Um, we really support a high raw or all raw diet. Um, so we take people through a whole process of inner transformation in the psyche down to the cellular level mm -hmm. in the body, usually on retreat a couple of times a year. And we're going to bring back our women's retreats next year. I'm really passionate about women uh -huh. and what we do together as women and helping women to understand different uh, hormonal changes in their body. And um, it's also just very practical skills. You know, this is how... This is how you do these protocols. This is how you break it down. This is how you can teach it. And this is how you can live it from just a very simple daily lifestyle to building a, a business out of it. I guess what you've just said kind of calls me back to now speak more again of, of the two of you as a couple, as this union. And because you spoke about your passion for working with women and I remember when you were doing your engagement ceremony, Anthony, you said something that really touched me about your past and how you finally feel ready as a man mm. to make this commitment. Mm. And so there was a sense of um, both of you having a knowing of your embodiment of the feminine and masculine divine and that union between the two mm. of you and those two aspects within and between you both. I mean, is that how you feel? Is that what you feel you are doing? Uh, yeah, I think that. Um, I think that honestly, I think that we've held each other to the highest possible standard um, of showing up, and uh, and we've held ourselves to that too. So that's where the shadow came in was uh, around sexuality, uh, learning to understand it in a new way. Um, learning to be in a more noticing space than in an active space and um, and harvesting what 
we normally step over in the rush to get there or to get the woman or to have our peak experience and um, that was actually conditioned quite a lot by the illness because I was not able to really move so as uh, the second time my second as it's, as a friend of mine called it the second great illness or something mm. which is where I needed to get the rest of my lessons and the rest of my teachings but um, that was um, very powerful because we could really only look at each other for weeks and feel um, as a man feel like I'm not performing right. yes. I can speak for myself I'll let Amy speak for herself and to hold that and to be okay with that to be in my power with it for it not to be degrading and not to be uh, not to make me wrong and um, so that all needed to be worked out in order for us to be intimate to come close and that meant our past, our sexual past needed its healing and we both had different ones of course but mm. mine needed a lot of love a lot of self forgiveness and a lot of um, holding my inner child and making friends with him and giving him a name and keeping him on my Facebook page all the time and a little picture of him so I can keep him present yeah mm. it's been a very different journey with, with Anthony because in the past I would be driven by um, lust really you know, driven by just a, a pure kind of chemical, more kind of, you know, animalistic, like, oh, you, I see something in you, and that's, that's what I want, you know. And Anthony um, really wouldn't have that type of behavior from me at all. And it's not that I didn't find him attractive in all the years we were first friends. I thought he was a very beautiful, attractive man. I, I honestly revered him so much that He's probably one of the first men that I did find attractive that I wouldn't just project my sexuality onto or, or I, I, I'll have you for the taking, unconscious sort of behavior. Um, so it was a very clear, clean place that we came together into a, a friendship. And what we kind of realized was a, a courtship really of sorts. Mm -hmm. And then in this, in this illness, um, that's just about you know, sexuality or being able to share on that deeper level of that sort, it was just not, um, not the priority, obviously. You know. So it brought up a lot for me, a lot in terms of um, not being reinforced in a way that I was used to being reinforced in our relationship or validated, feeling validated or or that we're intimate, now we're close because this is happening, what we're used to doing together. But part of what was shedding uh, for me was how I find value or worth in myself and therefore with a man and what we share. And realizing a lot of that was based on uh, not the totality of depth that I'm capable of because it was much more biochemical or animalistic or you know you look a certain way or driven driven, mm. driven really mm. and and he would keep pointing this out to me and it would be very difficult for me to receive feeling rejected not wanted um it felt like a neutering of sorts losing my my what i had identified what i thought was my femininity Yet, he kept loving me, and he didn't reject me. Emotionally, he was rejecting a certain behavior that what I realized in retrospect, every relationship I had would eventually fall apart because of this projection of really like wanting, needing, give me this, give me this, reinforce me, reinforce me. Yeah. And he wouldn't, he just, he didn't have the energy in the first place to do it anymore. 
But in this period, something really changed where he still hold me and still loved me. And there was no lack of intimacy on one level, but what my mind was so, so deeply conditioned for, for intimacy, wasn't getting filled up. Yeah. And it angered me. Yeah. I'd be angry with him and, and punishing <laughs> towards him. And, you know, to the point where it's like, okay, well, what am I going to do? You're not meeting my needs. Right. You're not giving me what I need. What I want. You know, yeah, you're not giving me what I want. Mm -hmm. But he kept loving me. He kept holding me. He, he never rejected me. And again, I realized in past relationships that eventually would tear my relationship apart with someone because no one could fulfill my constant demand, <laughs> my constant need. And over time, it was about an eight month period. We were pretty much, we were celibate really this whole time. So difficult for me, just excruciating mm -hmm. pain. Just feeling, you know, feeling neglected. You know, I'm realizing like, wow, what it really got me down into is all my trauma really. Yeah. Growing up, mainly being reinforced that my value came through my sexuality or how I look or um, how much I please him. He didn't want any of that. In fact, he was repulsed by it. You know, if, if I ever would, you know, uh, let's say, oh, here, look at my butt sort of attitude. He said, like, I mean, I don't find that attractive. What? <laughs> what do you mean? I can, always, I can always manipulate with my sexuality. What do you mean? Come on. <laughs> the shadow feminine. This is what out. we meant. Yes. Yeah. Very much. And, and, and it's a bit dangerous when it's in a conscious way because I can find every reason why I could speak for my own need not being met. Mm -hmm. Yet mm -hmm. still be loved through all of that and to mm -hmm. be shown how to come back into myself and to be in touch in here it's, it's really been so healing on a deep fundamental level where I feel much more dignified in myself not prudish still my my wild and crazy self but I'm not um ooh, I kind of hate to say this it feels kind of funny to say this but almost like unconsciously prostituting myself for love oh yeah no that's that's a key part of the, the shadow feminine yeah you know? It feels really tender to say that, but and to be with a man that wouldn't take advantage of that and wasn't attracted to that and just simply wouldn't have it, but also didn't reject me. Well, this this he he won my heart and showed me not taught me, but through his love showed me something else. And I just I, I could just be forever bowing to him for loving me in this way and not taking advantage of me or what I'd always say, oh, men just use me. But little did I realize how much I put myself in that position. So it's, it's just an amazing journey with him. <laughs> yeah, gosh, that's really elevating one another. Mm. Yeah, that's, that was a tough period. Yeah. <laughs> Not to hold for both of us, I think. Yeah. And again, gosh, for me, that just comes back to what I see so clearly and more people I speak to in my own life experience, which is that we go to these pits, really, these really dark places, difficult places, near death, the deepest shadow. And if we have the courage to go there, or sometimes we don't even, we're not even given a choice, it seems like, but from that, yeah. There's the potential for so much more yeah. to open within us. Yeah. Very good to yeah. Know. yeah, you spoke earlier about a new project, a new co creation, Gateways to Intimacy. I'm guessing this has, is, you know, is informed by what you've been living and experiencing. But can you talk a little bit about this? So, or is it top secret? <laughs> <laughs> No, I think we can talk about it. Um, you know, first of all, I didn't say earlier when you were asking about my training and thing, I didn't really answer your question, so maybe I'd like to get to that at another moment if possible. But what I do find is that most of the people, uh, the, 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 the demographic of people that I work with are women. Uh -huh. And by far, m the majority is sort of 80 or 85%. 
and um, the, the, in the age bracket of 25 to 55. Mm -hmm. And um, I understand, I mean, that teaches me that, and I'm told that I'm safe to be around, and um, that's because I exhausted myself in the 60s. <laughs> I remember <laughs> saying to Amy during, our, during that testing period, I said, I just can't do that anymore. I, don't, I, can't, I can't objectify you like that. I just know it's a quick descent to the end of another cycle of relationship, and I would really love to invest in something and have more possibility than that. Um, and so I think by virtue of my journey, the, the darkness and the shadow of my, my youth to, um, to not, to understand what longing means really, to understand that, that when I long for somebody, I'm unconsciously objectifying them and I'm making them what I need or the goal of my attention mm. or my conquest or whatever language you use in whichever decade you're living, um, that, the, that it's really the, in the longing that the message lies, not in the achieving what I'm longing. And that was a huge lesson for me, and um, especially around sexuality. So to feel the feeling without seeking the resolution of it. And um, there are so many metaphors for this in music and in life, like that note before resolution where you're waiting for the song to come back to the whole again. And it's that moment of suspense that is so valid and so rich. And so much what we both experienced during that eight months, that it was really the essence of the courtship, was learning to live with the longing and to celebrate the longing rather than the result of the longing, which is remarkably quick in a way. You know, the longing is really where the richness is. And so what, what I wanted to do and what I was so fascinated about in our, in our engagement of relationship was that it got to the point where if Amy would walk in the room, I would feel a sexual feeling. And I'm always noticing the shape of the space that's between us. I mean, it's always, you know how like those two faces that look at each other form the shape yes. of a chalice? Yes, yeah, yeah. And that's moving all the time and it's morphing and it's all, I feel it now, I've got goosebumps as I think about where her body is and what form it's making and what the shape is that we're creating together. So for me, gateways to intimacy is about how can we be conscious of what that shape is and how can we work with it joyfully and with the co-commitments as our guide to be together and to be in a permanent state of awakening rather than deadening and repeat. So I think the gateway is where we would potentially repeat okay but now it's the gateway you can either go through the gateway yeah. and that's probably where a shadow is yeah. or where we're challenged or where we might blame or huff off or run away yeah. and instead okay are we going to go through this gateway or are we going to go around and around and around till you don't even want to look at that person anymore and you have to just get away from each other you know so okay here's the gateway here's the opportunity and so trespassing or, or excuse me um going into surpassing and going into these places something else is opening up from there and then opening up and then a deeper root of trust is built where i know no matter what it is now with him he's still going to be there that doesn't give me carte blanche to act out in any way actually it gives me reverence and say thank you because i know he's going to be there so it puts the onus on me to keep rising up to say, hey, I think we're at a gateway, or he says, hey, we're at a gateway. Keep going, traversing it. And so this, this gateways to intimacy, is this more going to be work that's geared to couples um, and encompassing more than breath work and all, all your pre previous learnings and teachings? Mm -hmm. or 
Well, that's quite intuitive view. I, I think it, it does um, encompass even more than what we've been doing individually, and we don't even know exactly what it is yet, and we're just experimenting with it. We already wanted to do something with it over a year ago, and we realized, like, no, we, we need to <laughs> stay focused on yeah. ourselves, yeah. and let's keep learning what this thing is, and we're, we're just baby birthing some of the first stages, but it's really showing us and teaching us. We don't really know exactly what it is per se. It's showing us what it wants to be and what to do. I think, yeah, a lot of, uh, a lot of my practice is being present with what it is that wants to happen. So I use a, a meditation technique and my breath work is all about that. So there's a lot of trust and acceptance that what will unfold will unfold. But what's really happened is in the visits that I've made to Amy's retreats and workshops and the visits she's made into mine that people keep coming up and saying, we want more. We want more of what it is that you have. There's something about you that is so, whatever it is, that, that appealing in some way. And so um, I think we're both feeling that how can we stay small and offer that, you know, not get taken by it, but, yeah. to, but also to show up in a way that can really support. And it's not just for couples, no, I think it's mm -hmm. really life, it's life. It's parenting, really. Um, we won't ever have a physical child together, but I think this is our child together, is to hold people together in whatever context yeah. it is and however we can, whenever it is. And it's not just a class or a retreat, it could be in a grocery store, or it could be um, in a restaurant or in any situation, like how can we just by nature, we're not necessarily looking for it, it's just to be available to hold in whatever capacity that we can be of benefit to others in, in what we share, or our own growth, as, as an offering, to always be ready, mm. to always be ready. Yeah, you mentioned service as a big part of your mission, really, your purpose for both of you. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And so it could be intimacy, it could be with a breath, it could be with detox or food or a sharing or right here, right now with us or with our dog, his children, our family, whatever, you know. How can, how can I be out of my way enough that I can actually be there for another because I'm doing my own work? There's this great word community that being used more and more. People are also using the word tribe, which kind of like I mm. always find a bit jarring. In fact, one time we looked it up in the dictionary, in the Apple dictionary, and it says division. Try, three. Try, it means yeah. a division of three. Comes, that's this etymology. And yeah. it always bothered me, tribe, because you either in it or out of it. And when you're in it, if you're not in it, you don't belong. And if you are in it, you do belong. And that's where we have duality as replicated. And Right. So as much as we want to belong, how can we belong without having to make someone not belong? Mm. And that's a really live question for mm. me. It's a, it's a live inquiry. So I'm always seeking in every encounter to let people know they belong. You know, it's so valid to let people know they belong. And um, so coming into unity, creating community is a moment. It's a feeling of, am I helping others to belong? Is that what I'm serving? Or am I, turn, am I turning towards duality and away from community? And just my tribe. Am I only about my tribe? For, for us, it's more uh, just a welcoming of, yeah, of all of us in, in whatever state we come in, big, small, skinny, fat, you know, short, whatever color. You know, to us, it's just, it's just a, a welcoming of the family of humanity mm. in all our raw states, in our craziness, mm. in, in our insecurities, in our joy, not because... Um, it, in that moment. In that moment, mm. you know, not, not because it, it fits a certain look or a trend or a fashion, but because this is what we're here to do, to, to be available. Mm. I wonder how you see the future unfolding for your projects, you have many projects on the go, and spaces, and workshops, and... <laughs> we've got a manifester and a manifesting generator here, so we are trouble. I mean, we've got so much going on, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what is your vision going forward? 
breathing, more people using the breath to grow and understand and nourish themselves. Um, and training more trainers to train facilitators, just like Amy, it's the same program. And um, I'm excited because we've got our first agreement with North America and Canada to the French speaking people where one of my um, one of my students who's very advanced is going to start teaching it in French. He's going to start teaching trainers in, in France. So we're now just beginning to really get into some wonderful expansion of possibility. So that's important to me. And I'm also developing a lot on the internet, doing a lot of webinar breathworks that are extraordinary. It's extraordinary what happens in just 30 minutes of breathing with I had 37 different countries attending a breath work three weeks ago before I came to Bali. And at the end of the breath work, they become friends. They, there is com this, this community that I spoke of. So there's no limit to the outreach now. I'm looking at new ways to introduce more people to it. And many of my graduates who are facilitators are now starting to use webinars to spread the breath more quickly. Um, Does that mean that people see you and hear you? When they do, here? and oh. I see each of them too. Oh, really? So I have big screens, and I have you know twenty-five people on each screen, and I can speak to each one of you. You oh, know, yeah. I can address you and and give you guidance, and oh, yeah. um, mm -hmm. it's so powerful. But it's just headphones, it's just headphones and an internet connection, and I think it really appeals to people who'd rather be private. So mm. in the European culture, it's really very popular, mm. uh, where they're a little bit less mm. open than they might be in the US or in Ubud, for example. Um, mm. And our joint vision also, in, in the grounded sense, is the Ark, which is this wonderful place that has transformed mm. so many lives already and is so blessed. It's so special. And we have such a relationship with the spirits that leave, live here and the temple that's at the bottom of the hill and our dear partners who are the original owners of the land and it's all about giving something back to Bali for us too so Amy can speak mm. to that a little bit it's mm. this wonderful project that she's hatched and giving birth to right now we just started our legal entity here on Bali which is called Give Back Bali and um, as a retreat center, we are licensed really, not just within our retreat center, but within our legal establishment to help other retreat leaders to do their work here legally. It's been a big problem for retreat leaders to actually work legally on Bali, okay. but we can give people the opportunity to do their work 100% legal through our events management company. And um, the concept is that our group will come in and help educate their students on Bali and how we can be good guests here and help preserve the culture. So we're, we're excited to um, you know, support local people, support what's happening here on Bali. Um, and we give scholarships to Indonesians. Yeah. We, ask, we ask the events, the people, the facilitators to come, that come to also give scholarships to yeah. Indonesians as well. Yeah, yeah we, really, we really feel like... Um, with Indonesia, not just Indonesians, but with indigenous people everywhere <coughs> worldwide, there's a seed there that we all really need in this world. And so to help preserve local cultures, um, it's kind of like preserving all of our humanity in a way so it doesn't get so diluted into like a kind of white bread <sighs> way of being. <laughs> You know, a generic way of being that stays alive, that, that is cultural, that is rich with tradition and ancient history that teaches us of spirit, of spirits. So that's a big part of our work. And again, here at the Ark and our workshops and retreats and um, supporting other people in their work as well as teachers, and helping produ to produce other events that are not just our own, but other people who are um, really committed to this, this global vision that we all share. Yes. In, in a legal way, where everyone's safe. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. What a beautiful vision. Yeah. Well, it already is. Yeah. It already is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Um, are there any parting words you would have for our audience who'll be watching this, your followers, any parting message that you might have, something from your heart you'd like to share? Mm. Hmm. Yes. Um, I would just encourage everybody today whatever day it's being seen to go and reach out to someone and ask them to take three breaths and look you in the eye and see what happens um, I think um, what, I, what I would like to share is is that hope inside that you know we're all healers we're we're all artists and to keep nurturing that place and keep believing in it even for people who might be surrounded in in a climate where people may not feel understood or they may not feel like anyone's relating to them that um, there's a whole crew of us on this earth a whole mm. big posse of us on this earth that do understand uh, more subtle energies of what it means to to care, to share, to want to contribute to others, to grow, and that no one's alone, and to keep reaching out and keep finding that place of how we can all come together and share what we have to give, because we all have that something special to give that only that person can give in the way that they do, and to keep finding the expression for that and believing in it and persevering no matter the challenges or odds that they may face. Yeah. I kind of feel like I'd like to close this meeting with some breaths together, actually. Mm. <laughs> it feels right to do that. Thank you so much, Antonina. Thank you to Luna, who's been holding space with us.